Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Patrick Tan, General Counsel for Chainalgos. We are the blockchain intelligence firm made famous for uncovering Binance's BUSD $1.4 billion under collateralization. With me, as usual, every week, our CEO, Chief Data Scientist, Jonathan Ryder. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. So, big week this week. Bitcoin ETF was approved. I know you guys have been looking forward to seeing what happens. We're going to dive a little bit into the technicalities of what an ETF is, what it does, how does it work, how, what it can do, what it can't do. I think there's quite, I've been quite a bit of misunderstanding exactly as to what an ETF is. <coughs> I've actually seen some people who claim to have been in finance not know what an ETP is. So, um, uh, and some of them actually thought that was a typo. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. It's kind of uh, That's banal. a cultural thing, though. They don't exist in the U.S. as much. So Fine. Yeah. I mean, whatever. Um, next, we're going to talk about pig butchering. No, nope, we're not making, we're not slurring porky but we're going to just talk a little bit about how our research has and we've been able to release some research right now not just um our work together with bitrace but we've expanded that research into some other stuff with uh sean waterman from newsweek as well as linking that stuff to the stuff that tom wilson from reuters has done and how we've been able to basically show that at least insofar as the research that and data that we have right now as of this minute uh, we're looking at about 12 countries who have been affected by what appears to be the same uh, scam and pig butchering scam. We'll talk a little bit about that. You can read more about it on our Medium page. Um, it gives you all the details. Um, but if you want even more details and a bigger narrative, that's going to come up in the next couple of weeks. Finally, we'll talk about Crypto's killer app. What do you think it is? No surprises and no prizes for guessing. So let's just jump straight into a Bitcoin ETF. John, I'm not the most... Um, uh, financially savvy, or I, I, I'm, I never worked in financial services, um, you know, so I don't know. Uh, okay, all right. About so ETFs. So tell, tell us about people ETFs. People think of an ETF as a, some sort of special purpose company, some SPV you own shares in, and it holds whatever underlying assets. So it's an oil ETF, it holds oil or gold or futures or certain equities, bonds. And you can have a bond ETF, it holds a bunch of bonds. Um, and conceptually, that's fine. And long term, that's, that's totally reasonable. So to think of one of these spot physical Bitcoin ETFs as a some special purpose company that you're a shareholder in that holds Bitcoin in some custodial arrangement with whatever somebody. Uh, that's correct uh, long term on average. Okay. The question is how it sort of operationally works day to day, how shares get created, redeemed, uh, who buys the Bitcoin, where that kind of stuff comes from. And that's where things, as you were alluding to, seem like some people don't really know how this works and are Maybe guessing, I don't really know. Um, so the first thing to note is if there's no net inflow or outflow over some reasonable period of time, hour, day, whatever, then you just buy shares off whoever's selling the shares. So nobody's buying or selling any Bitcoin. They're already there, whatever, and it's fine. So the price goes up and down to track the underlying, but uh, that's it. How does the price go up and down? Some market maker type sits there and says, because I know I can get the coins out and put the coins in through some kind of a procedure, whatever, we come back to that in a second, I'm happy to, you know, say it's trading at 20,000, I'll buy it 19.9 and sell at 20.1. It's trading at 50,000, I buy it. And so one goes up and down and you just buy and sell. And as long as I'm buying and then selling overall in the market, net flat amount, I buy 100 off you, you sell 100, that's it. No issuance, no redemption, no Bitcoin being bought, no nothing happening. Fine. As long as prices stay pretty close to, you know, wherever the underlying level is, there's no massive demand pushing that one way or another. Fine. Now, let's say that there are more people who want to come in and buy. Well, what you're going to see there is persistently the underlying's trading at 40,000, and this thing's trading at 41,000, 40,500, whatever, some amount that's over it. Now you have people who are market maker, authorized participant, whatever, the term doesn't really matter, who are able to create and redeem the underlying shares. So they'll come in and say, I can put together the underlying for 40. You'll give me 40,500. All right, I'll take your money. I'll create more shares. And then at that time, they'll go out and they'll purchase the underlying to do that. Uh, I'm speaking a little bit in generalities because there are uh, a dozen or so of these products out there. They all have different authorized participants. Those people will all behave in somewhat different ways. This is what bank ETF trading desks, ETF issuers do. It's their full-time job. So this is a little bit general to cover all of them. And many people will put in orders to buy on the close right, or on the open or whatever, not even realizing that they're putting in an order to buy on the close. And what will happen there is if there's surplus demand versus number of shares that are outstanding, the authorized participant will have them create a bunch of shares, 
go by the underlying at that time, stuff them in there, and deliver the shares to everybody. So it's a very long way of saying there is no direct connection between you pressing the buy button on your interactive brokers, Fidelity, Schwab, whatever account, and someone going and buying something on an exchange doing that. You will see some kind of indirect connection between those things as the many actors involved hedging their exposures go ahead and even things up, but do not assume that if you press buy, someone is going out there and buying some Bitcoin, whatever, somewhere. There's no reason to believe that's going to happen. There is no way you can know in advance if that's happening. I will repeat that. There is no way you can know in advance if that's happening. Even if you go to the issuer and you do it yourself, if they have people who come in to redeem, they'll just deliver you their shares instead of creating new ones. Yeah. So there is no way you can know. This is how market making works in all kinds of markets. If you buy S&P 500 tracking futures, probably underneath that some desk is buying futures. Maybe their cash desk has a surplus of basket versus futures and delivers you the physical underlying, whatever. All kinds of different stuff can happen. This is uh, the complexity that's been in enabled by derivative finance in general. Um, it makes some of this stuff much more efficient. It makes some stuff somewhat more difficult. I mean, people buy funds that are linked to credit indices. Right? You really think somebody's going out there and buying $127 face amount of each of these bonds? It doesn't work that way. You do some kind of generic higher level hedge, there's some mismatch amount, that's that. Um, so stop trying to find a direct linkage. You will absolutely see signs that something happened, that distortion, if the buying authorized participants use Coinbase and then people are selling their tokens on Binance or whatever, you will see the types of, of charts and dislocations that people have seen. This is totally normal stuff in finance you see all the time. Cash futures basis is a thing in equities and bonds and all kinds of things. So anyway. So yeah. I, the only real fundamental difference between this one and the cash shell futures that used to that, that trade on uh, CME is that in, in this case, the underlying is the actual. That's right. Spot, that's right. Uh, spot Bitcoin, but in terms of its ability to influence price in uh, global markets, uh, I mean, because in the case of the CME futures linked <coughs> stuff, there's not much interest in the CME futures, yeah. right? And people don't trade those that tightly against the physical underlying. The linkage isn't that tight. Whereas here, uh, you know, within the next couple hours, day, whatever, some short-term period of time, if there's persistent demand or persistent uh, selling, withdrawing demand. People will go on, effectively on Coinbase and just buy up the tokens. And there are people who are actively arbitraging Coinbase versus Binance, whatever, other exchange, Uniswap, no matter. Um, so the connection is a bit stronger there only because the sort of spot futures spread, no, not that many people play and push that hard, and there's no interest, right? If it turns out that the overall amount of interest in these products isn't very large, you're never going to see price dislocations again. It's not going to make any difference. It's not even clear how much of this was real net demand versus random excitement from people trying to show how busy these things were. Um, we'll find out. Uh, it would not be the first product to have a flurry of interest for the first four days, and two months later, no one has any idea what happened. Uh, yeah, that's true. I remember a couple different things. The yeah, there's a, there, there are plenty of products. Um, there's a yeah. long history of... Uh, 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 there's a long financial history of products with, which, which you know, kicked off with a bang, fizzled out. People forgot about it. Eventually, got shut down. I mean, the tons C of them. The CBOE Bitcoin futures were dis delisted because nobody. Well, cared. I mean, that's the more recent one, but there, oh, there, there's oh, stuff yeah, from yeah, like yeah, '80s yeah, and yeah. the '90s. Uh, things linked to gold. There's some gold products of, yeah, that yeah, just yeah. kind of imploded, and you would think you know, gold gold's been around since yeah. what ancient Mesopotamia. People should uh, have. It, it predates that. The gold was made in stocks. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, anyway. no. anyway. right. Yeah, so it, it's it's a little <coughs> bit complicated. This is not meant to say don't look into it. It's meant to say you're not going to find these types of direct linkages because the market is the thing connecting these. I mean, these are not the direct linkages you're looking for. But so. um, yeah, it's, it, you can probably learn something about how generic ETF hedging and whatever derivative markets are connected, but it's a, it's a special and, case of that. And at this juncture, I think I want to make it uh, kind of clarify that. So there, you know, there's been quite a bit of a brouhaha, I guess, uh, on on crypto Twitter as well as uh, online about how Gary Gensler has, um, you know, he came out to say some stuff, and then, um, but he still voted in favor of the thing. Now, I think it's important to separate the two. Number one, he he kind of had to vote in favor, and this is something that we spoke about on the podcast a long time ago, is that because the CME futures were um, approved, they kind of painted themselves. They into got a themselves corner. in a weird spot. Yeah. 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 
because on a, I mean, regardless of what you think about uh, the product, the underlying, I mean, it's not not relevant. At least from a legal principles perspective, it is true that if you do approve the CME futures product, you can't use an artificial con- construct of a different set of arguments to say that manipulation doesn't. Yeah, you know, it's hard to understand it's how very, those are consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. very very difficult right. to say that it's okay in one situation because it's cash settled because yeah. the, the differences are not significant enough. Yeah. They're too subtle to, to say that you know oh it, it, it you know they're completely different uh, things and the, the same considerations and the same concerns don't apply which is just and that was why from a long time ago we kind of knew that this was going to happen one way yeah, or the other. Yeah. Now that having been said, the SEC doesn't endorse any kind of product. Yeah, it was a bit weird for him to come <coughs> out and reiterate that, but I guess that this industry does have a history of misrepresenting approvals as endorsements and. I mean, the whole Coinbase as one thing is about misrepresenting the and approval way endorsement. To so, understand oh, okay. this is the, the easiest way to understand this is this: if I give you a license to operate a restaurant, I'm not saying that your food is good, or even that the food isn't going to make you sick because yeah. they'll come in and inspect to make sure that you. Yeah. Correct. All I'm saying is, is that you can operate a restaurant. You said you, we could serve raw oysters, yeah, but not like that. Yeah, you. I mean, if you get if if somebody gets sick off of it, you know, we'll do something about it. Not a bad analogy for securities fraud, anyway. So in- oh, and that one uh, interesting side effect oh, there yeah. is that GBTC's fees have now collapsed, ah, yes, which means yes, that DCG yes. doesn't have any more money. And it's, I find it amusing that no one seems to have discussed this issue the last couple of days, or maybe I haven't seen it if they have. Um, that whole bankruptcy proceeding is about to take an interesting turn because there is no more cash cow. Uh, there is only historical cash held by the CEO and his personal accounts, and something tells me people are going to come for those a bit more aggressively if they're the only money left. Spoiler alert, we already talked about this a long time ago. <laughs> oh, we, we predicted that there would be a change. I'm just surprised that people haven't, you know, had time to realize that yet. We've written about this extensively. We wrote about how the only way out was uh, uh, sort of via an ETF. And now that they found that way out... And selling it before the fees collapse. Now they can't sell Grayscale for anything. And now it is going to explode. And uh, have a look at the Medium page because we wrote extensively about that. Yep. Um, and then it will sort of give you a precursor as to what's going to happen If next. you're a Gemini Earn creditor, uh, the thing that you thought was going to give you a bunch of money just went to zero. I think the Spanish term for that is hasta luego. It's time for you to go with God. Because, uh, you know, that's <coughs> Genesis is going to help you at this stage. See, see if we can get uh, Schwarzenegger on the podcast to, just to do the quote for us. Probably. So um, next one is Pigs. So you like bacon? I like bacon. Um, we're going to talk about the bacon that is this massive pig butchering scam that we... So our initial um, uh, research report that we did with Bitrace, the amazing blockchain intelligence, uh, Chinese blockchain intelligence firm, if you've never heard of them, go check them out. Um, and it was really good fun working mm-hmm. with them. It was one of the, the best experiences I've had in, in recent times in terms of uh, collaborations. <coughs> and we uncovered this... Uh, we connected scams basically in the U.S. and China, and the off ramps and stuff like that. And it, it quite clearly appears that there's not that many people who are perpetrating these scams. Now, well, they're at least affiliated with each other. They use the same <coughs> laundering services. They're, they're not totally they're different. not totally yeah. um, divorced yeah. from each other. I mean, they clearly know each other. And on top of that, what we've seen is that we've been able to now connect that to Tom Wilson's excellent reporting for Reuters. We've been able to connect that as well with um, Sean Waterman's excellent reporting for Newsweek. And the combination of all of those things now reveals that it seems between 11 and 12 countries are affected, including Romania, United Kingdom, um, like, Sweden, yeah, Ger- Germany, Turkey, all kinds of all, all kinds of countries. Yeah, it's, it's um, in the it's in the the medium page and it's, yeah. it's as well as on the Twitter page. Um, yeah, so that's one that. Well, you, I mean, no. so we've managed to show interlocking, overlapping use of service providers, exfiltrating money for. I think we found 16 service providers at this point, a dozen countries. Uh, we're only looking at five legal cases. In Although all, I will say one of them includes uh, dozens and dozens of example victims. So it's not ex- five, five legal cases. Correct. But, you know. And it all started from just one case in Florida. That was the one thread we pulled on that kind of linked up to all of these other ones. Yeah, so we now have a, a good base of uh, operations here to sort of expand out the scope of how these things work, both connecting on the off-ramping side and on the ingestion side the scam entry so you may ask yourself okay 
what's the big deal? You know, I mean, you've hooked, linked up all these scams, these uh, transnational cross-border scams. Uh, they're victims in the U.S. and China. Okay, what's the big deal? I mean, like, we've all known that. True. You may have known that. Have you been able to prove that, though? So, And the volumes are enormous. Enormous. So we're up to over a billion dollars in off-ramping, which is huge. And you know that we're not finished mapping the space out yet, right? This is just the place that we're starting from. Each new case we add to the research is adding hundreds of millions of dollars. If you read any of the um, the FBI... Internet, Internet Crime Complaint yeah. Center, I think, uh, which is a thing that tracks whatever online scammy stuff around the world. Uh, their annual reports give estimates of the total size and number of victims, whatever, and the rest of it. And the, you know, f- by some measures, five, by some measures, maybe a hundred victims we've looked at are a pretty small slice of that. Um, and we're, yeah, we're likely to be able to build this up to a much, much larger amount of money. Um, what fraction of crypto that is remains to be seen. But, uh, you know, if you're at a billion dollars on your second cut of uh, searching through something, it's probably going to turn out to be huge. Uh, okay, so now the, the question, why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because prior to this, most governments would say, okay, you know, this cross-border fraud thing, scams, whatever, uh, it's either a local problem or not as big a problem as we thought. Now we've been able to prove that it's not only not a local problem, it is a global problem, <laughs> and it's a lot bigger than, than, than... And this is when governments start to take notice. And it looks as though, the specific example I'll we'll talk about here regarding Genesis Block, FTX, Alameda Research, we've done some writing on this, there's some Twitter on this, it looks as though this was probably their real business. So nobody's ever understood why Alameda was getting these tens of billions of dollars in Tether. They talk about arbitrage for two basis points. The story doesn't make any sense. We've now managed to connect that directly to what are almost certainly much higher margin on and off ramp activities, right? So having a team that market makes for a basis point to facilitate there's enough tether out there when you're charging, I don't know how many hundred basis points the Cambodian OTC markets charge, but there's fees there, right? Go watch these Genesis Block interviews and read our stuff. Um, That explains why people were receiving these kinds of amounts of money, what they were doing with it, and why it was actually worth their while. And if this was the real business model of a lot of trading operations, it means that the crypto investor, retail use, whatever stuff was background noise to allow this to happen, right? So you let people use a service for small fees if it ramps up the volumes to a level where you can run through the guys who are paying you much larger fees to... And so this segues into the final thing. What is crypto's killer app? Yeah, so the one... People talk about stable coins as having a product market fit, and we've discussed repeatedly how... You know, fair enough, uh, a lot of the time the product market fit is the market for like soft criminal financial services, dollars, capital control evasion, this kind of stuff. Okay, that's a soft version that everybody's kind of okay with some amount of people in countries with restricted currencies, whatever. Uh, A lot of it here was definitely used to get irreversible cross-border transfers so these people could get around using the banking system. Again, we've posted links to interviews that are still on YouTube with people explaining that their customers were having their money frozen in banks because they were the proceeds of crime. That tells you at least that part of the banking system was working, and this was a thing they built to efficiently avoid some of those problems. To the extent there was some bank fraud involved and whatever, fine. It's not like the traditional system was perfect either, but explicitly this is a pipeline for extracting money using this ecosystem to avoid those types of controls which is interesting. Um, and, you know, it, it helps to explain a lot of things, right? And one of the things that it sort of now makes sense, why do you have zero fee trading? Why do you have all of this? Because it's, it's a bit like if you want to, you know, if you want to create enough of a commotion, enough of a noise, say, for instance, you're running away from somebody, the easiest thing to do is, as they have in the movies, lift up your gun, shoot it in the shopping mall, everybody start running, you hide your gun, you run out to get and, you know, else. exactly as we discussed with the ETFs, <coughs> right? If these people are using Tether for facilitating, because the vast majority of this is all Tether, obviously, you'd, it's easier to not have to be constantly doing bank wires. So if you can have a bunch of people money back and forth, there's a bunch of float in the system, it's a lot easier to run your Tether through, right? And cash them out by selling to the new guys, right? It's exactly like ETF creation, right? 
I can buy an ETF off of him. Nobody buys any Bitcoin, right? I buy a Tether off him. No dollars in a bank have to move, yeah. right? So you can simplify a lot of these things, and you're lowering the percentage of your business that's dodgy, which is good for everybody, I suppose, in every business. Um, all right. So win-win. Uh, the loser, I guess, is all of the victims whose money cannot be uh, sent back to them. Fair enough. And on that note, whether or not... Um, Money laundering is crypto's killer app. I think we'll find out in the coming days, weeks, and months what percentage of the flow is. Uh, I'm not of the view that it is anything close to 1%. Yeah, okay. So I guess we can quickly say the famous analysis thing from a while ago estimating that 1% of the flow is whatever, is crypto native crime. What we're talking about here is very much explicitly not part of that estimate. So we're starting to put together an estimate for a traditional type of a crime, whatever, fraud arrangement, that appears to work especially well using crypto because the payments are not reversible. Many of these scams have somebody go to an exchange, convert to Tether, and send Tether to some random scam address. That's how the thing starts because it's easier for them to process the money out the back end because the wire transfers would get locked, frozen, reversed, whatever. Um, so this is a cryptophilic type of a crime scheme. It doesn't require crypto, but it works much better there. They get along well. Um, yeah, and we're going to get a sense for how big this is as we, as we map it out. Uh, because these addresses are getting frozen, yep. right? So these are the things that keep coming up on the blacklists. These are the things to be afraid of your money getting caught in, right? This is not an intellectual exercise. This is a practical problem for anyone using the ecosystem. Because if it turns out this is a large fraction of what's going on, it means that the amount of freezing is going to skyrocket. Yep. And it increases the chances that if you choose a random wallet, it's going to get frozen. And on that note, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if you're listening to us on Spotify, thank you for uh, downloading the podcast or listening through a streaming service. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. In, uh, it helps us, it helps the algorithm, and it helps uh, us to get these videos out to as many people as possible. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.